In this episode, you'll learn how Spotify is helping to make service design famous. What else? Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Neve. This is the Service Design Show, episode 171. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show, the show where we explore the hidden secrets, tools and methods that you need to know about as a service design professional to be successful. All with the goal of helping you make a positive impact on your business, your customers and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Neve Parsley. Neef is the senior design manager at the number one global streaming platform you also know as Spotify. Neef has years of experience in different design disciplines like UX and product. And currently, Neef's role is to leverage the power of service design to help and design a better experience for Spotify listeners like you and me. Unless you have been deprived of an internet connection in the last decade, you of course know what Spotify is. Spotify's impact has skyrocketed over the last years and it captured the hearts of listeners across the world. Today, service design is one of the pieces that is helping to drive its growth even further. As you'll hear, Neve is on a mission, a mission to elevate design maturity within the company and our industry as a whole. This, for instance, means enabling more co-workers to use service design tools and methods within their day-to-day -day work. Because service design has the potential to be the approach that waves the work of UX product and other design disciplines together. Now, if this sounds a bit abstract, don't worry. I can assure you that we get very practical in this episode. Because if you'll stick around, you'll, for instance, learn how Neve started a service design guild inside Spotify and what made it catch on. You'll also hear how service design is helping different teams to collaborate better. And of course, you'll hear what it takes to make service design famous inside a large company. Well, that's about it for the intro. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Neve Parsley. Welcome to the show, Neve. Hi, Mark. Hey, good to have you on. Really excited about this uh, chat that we're going to have. Uh, you have some interesting insights and learnings about how to build and grow and nurture service design inside a uh, quite unique and large organization. We'll dive into that in a second. Uh, but for the people who haven't Googled you yet or listened to my introduction of this episode, could you briefly give an introduction of who you are and what you do these days? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Neve Parsley. I am at Spotify. I've been there for about a year and a half, leading designers from service design, product design, content design. Um, I do lots of focus on the customer lifecycle and journey um, and focusing on a robust messaging platform and organization that we have at Spotify. One and a half year. I'm sure you learned already a lot of things. Uh, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, before we dive in, uh, we have a lightning round. Five questions to get to know you as a person next to the professional a bit better. Uh, just the first thing that comes to your mind. I haven't prepared you, so uh, just just the first I'm thing. I'm a little nervous about this one. <laughs> Good. We'll see what it comes be. out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me start with question number one. That's an easy one to get, uh, get in. Uh, if you could be an animal, which animal would you like to be? Ooh, for some reason, squirrel came to mind first. I'm not proud of it, but that's just where my mind went. They're so fast and they can kind of go anywhere, yet a little graceful with the flow of their tails. Like so it. Go with it. Yeah, I have three squirrels in my backyard and I keep staring at them each and every morning. Uh, but that's <laughs> as a sidetrack. If you could recommend one book to anyone listening, which book would you recommend? Just one. Hmm. That's interesting. It might be Mismatch uh, by, oh, I'm embarrassed, Kat, I'm, I'm missing her last name, uh, but about inclusive design. It's a, a great read. I definitely recommend it. Yes. And uh, the last name is also sort of jumping my mind, but we'll get to it. It starts with an H. It starts <laughs> with an H. I know that. Well, we'll get to it and we'll make sure to add it in the show notes as always. Uh, Neve, what's always in your fridge? Milk. I don't drink milk, but I have young children. 
So milk is a staple. All right. Uh, uh, speaking about children, uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? I wanted to be a painter, uh, an artist. Yeah. And so I've actually recently uh, outfitted my office space to be half painting studio, half Spotify design leadership office. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Uh, and uh, last question, which is a tradition here on the show. Do you recall the first moment you got in touch with service design? I do. I was in grad school. Um, I was at Parsons studying design and tech, and I did an internship with a small design shop. And that's when I was first introduced to service design. Can we tell which design shop it was? Yes, it was called Acuity Group. It then merged with Fjord, which is now Accenture Song, Song I believe. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. A lot of evolution there. <laughs> A lot of mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> Consolidations yeah. in the industry. Cool. Uh, thank you for this lightning round. You did really well. Uh, no reason to be <laughs> to be nervous. Um, <laughs> let's dive into the topic of today. And um, uh, I had a hard time sort of summarizing it, but um, what if I would say that it's about uh, maturing service design inside a product-led organization? What, that, does that make sense? I think that's super close. Uh, the only edit I would make is maturing design in a product organization through service design. Ooh, interesting. That's an interesting nuance. Okay, let's unpack that uh, step by step. And the first thing uh, that I think would be really helpful to know is a bit more about your journey. So you mentioned your uh, at Spotify for the last 18 months, one and a half year. Um, how did you end up there? What is your current role? What are your responsibilities? So maybe we can set the stage a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think I technically I was hired as a product design manager. Personally, I'm not so interested in uh, hands-on product design. I've, I've done it because I think any uh, design leadership position should be fairly well-versed across different design functions. Um, but when I dug into the role a little bit more, I understood that service design would be hugely valuable to the org and perhaps uh, it wasn't identified explicitly as a need. Um, but the, the messaging organization at Spotify, as I mentioned, it's this robust, fairly mature at this stage um, platform for, we call them bandmates, uh, our internal Spotifiers to send communications out to listeners all, all over the world. And so we focus on these internal systems, processes, and um, tools, as well as that end listener facing experience. And so the opportunity to deeply connect those two layers um, was really enticing to me. So that's, that's what I kind of set out to do and have been doing for the past year and a half. Um, I've also led teams for new value creation in an interim uh, basis. And uh, we serve as a kind of a tight knit leadership team across design in um, uh, what's now the freemium organization. Okay, uh, cool. That sounds uh, like you've seen already a lot of parts uh, of the org. I, when I was preparing for our chat, I was curious to hear, like, what makes you interested in this topic? Like, what gets you going? Why did you decide to uh, share this with the audience? Yeah, it's a really good question. I It's messy. And I think a lot of product organizations struggle with design maturity. It's something that we've heard across the design industry broadly for years and years. Um, and uh, I think it was Envision who coined the design maturity model and framework. And it's been a super hot topic of like, how do we get design a seat at the table? Um, and I think there's such an opportunity for service design to really drive that because service design practitioners or folks who are well-versed in service design are also well-versed in business and technology and design and, and can really be that connective thread. Yeah, they should be at least <laughs> first in, yeah. in technology and business. Um, and, and, and still the question remains, uh, what makes you passionate about this? What which opportunity do you see? Yeah, that's an even better question that I still haven't answered. <laughs> uh, well, I think that no one's solved it yet. 
that's why I'm interested in it. It, it doesn't feel like anyone's doing it perfectly. Um, and I think there's just a lot of opportunity for more forward progress. Um, and I think that, again, like service design practitioners and leaders are, are super well suited to make forward progress and help others do the same as well. Now, uh, a term like design maturity and elevating design maturity uh, can mean a lot of things. Uh, I'd like to understand a little bit, what does it mean to you? Like, what does the elevating design maturity mean for you? Yeah, I think I'm going to go back to the cliche of having a seat at the table. Um, I think if I were to boil the ocean and reduce it down to a single phrase or two, I think it would be that, that design thinkers and leaders are involved in um, important organizational product and service decision making. One thing I didn't mention at the start and which might also be helpful for some context is uh, the way we got in touch is that I read an article by um, I think people from your team about how service design is organized at Spotify. And I was really um, uh, amazed, positively uh, amazed by the article. For me, it felt like uh, almost a manifesto that any internal service design team should have. And I thought, well, I need to know what's going on here. So uh, that's how we got in touch. Um, about this article and sort of the, the ideas and the visions that live within Spotify, I'm, I'm curious, why did this article come to be? Because this is not the only one. Um, there are, I think, th at least three or four. Why are you publishing this? Yeah, so that article first was written by uh, Grace, Rebecca, and Marco, who are all uh, incredible design practitioners across different business units uh, in Spotify. So that's one thing that I want to highlight that's really special about uh, the service design community at Spotify, that we are really deeply collaborating across the entire organization. Um, and this article came to be because we had started the Service Design Guild, which I'm sure we can uh, dig into a little more as well. And uh, thinking about the guild started with two design leaders just connecting over a fika, so a casual coffee chat. And we decided to create this community because we started identifying service design happening across the organization, but no one was really talking to each other. And once the community came together, we understood that a lot of people outside of Spotify likely don't know that service design is happening in Spotify. Um, and so we wanted to get the word out there because you might see a role posted that we're hiring for like a senior product designer or, or something, and it might turn away folks who are traditionally trained service designers when really like we're we're looking for you. Uh, we need service designers. We need folks who who think uh, and and use those those service design methodologies. And so it was important for us to come forward with an accurate representation of like this is what part of our design org is focused on and doing. Yeah, and it's super cool that you're sort of stating that publicly and planting a flag. And uh, I can imagine that it also it almost also uh, read like a, a manual or how to use us as service designers internally. You could potentially keep this internal, but I you're doing our community a great service by actually sharing this uh, in a broader yeah broader spectrum. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, like it's been extremely beneficial internally as well. We recently launched uh, or relaunched our career framework for entire design org and have incorporated serv the service design function as a part of that, too. So it's all a part of uh, making service design famous, both within Spotify and outside. Hmm. Uh, so many things you mentioned the guilt you mentioned the career framework uh, already all the things that i uh want to touch upon so uh where should uh, let's let's maybe uh s stick uh a bit longer with uh, sort of the the way service design is currently organized at spotify you mentioned something uh about two service design leaders uh connecting with each other over fika uh how, could you could you take us on a journey how service design maybe has evolved in the recent months, years at Spotify and where is it today? Yeah, absolutely. Like many things at Spotify, it's been fairly organic. Um, so uh, myself and Jason Gang, who is also in our org, a design leader here, are both 
traditionally trained as service designers, but leading mostly product designers um, in, in our respective orgs. And we set up time to just connect as humans and service design thinkers. Um, and so to date, service design has been organized uh, similar to how we might staff product design, which is embedded in orgs and teams. So whether that's uh, what we call a tribe or a product area or a squad. Um, and long term, that's likely not the necessarily the right approach. I think it's definitely right for the level of maturity that the function of service design is at Spotify. So we have embedded service designers. So Grace, who was one of the co-authors of that article is in business affairs, Marco's in content design and safety, Rebecca's in messaging. Um, so we, we are fairly embedded in that way. You mentioned that, uh, it might not be that way in the future, but, uh, right now that fits the current tribe or the current organization organizational model best is that the reason why it's currently organized in that way yeah i would say it is i think there's a lot of opportunity for service design to have a lot of impact organized in this way like very focused within so i'll i'll focus on messaging as the example um there is a lot, there are many systems we use to message our listeners. There are many tools we use. There are many uh, touch points and channels that those communications appear for our listeners. There's so much opportunity just in that bubble of messaging. And um, of course, our, our service design practitioners need to extend beyond that to do their jobs well, but um, being able to create that focus and again, tying it back to making service design fake it, fo sorry, service design famous, uh, showcasing impact in those focused areas. So it's I see a really interesting uh, transition here because um, uh, we, we could almost say that service designers are currently based in a, in a mini company, like they have their own, like, I don't know, bubble or a department or uh, uh, area uh, of focus. And um, what I've been seeing, especially around in-house service designers is we want to connect sort of on a more, on a higher level and talk to other service designers, regardless whether they're working in insurance, healthcare or banking or Spotify. Um, is that also one of the reasons why something like the guild emerged? Yeah, I think there's this bi-directional dialogue that the service design community at Spotify is really hungry for. So we want to get our voice out there as we've started to do with things like that um, backstage tickets article uh, that, that you referenced. But we also want to learn from the community as well. Um, and so this is one of our focuses for this year in 2023 is to also just connect more with other practitioners and and share learnings and uh, connecting with other practitioners maybe even outside of Spotify. But I'm uh, yes. also also yeah. curious, like how is the um, what what is the shape and form of this internal guild? Yeah, so right now there are I believe 50 members uh, as a part of our Slack channel. Um, some of them are, are quiet lurkers on the activity. Um, some of them are actually managers of service designers who don't, who are not actually trained in service design themselves. So for them to stay in touch. And then we have uh, a smaller crew, smaller than 50, who are actively engaged, working on things like um, external comms, like the article you mentioned, and um, internal opportunity sourcing and things like that. And and sort of this grew from two to 50 in a period of le less than two years, basically, right? And yeah. and uh, I think you also mentioned that uh, it contains people who not per se, don't per se have the title service design, but aff affiliate or associate themselves with the practice. How do, how yes. do these people find uh, the community, the guild? I think there's been a lot of word of mouth. Uh, my um, my partner Jason and I did a presentation at a uh, an internal design conference that we held this past year in Barcelona, and we talked about service design. And within the hour, we had like our our numbers in our Slack channel started going up, and they started going up from people who weren't in attendance, which meant that people who were in attendance were 
slacking their friends who maybe were back uh, at their home office who were user researchers or um, data scientists or manager, whoever it might have been. And so I think it's just been a lot of word of mouth, honestly. Cool. Yeah. And uh, what makes, uh, do you have, if you uh, could make some uh, assumptions, what what is the thing that you feel is attracting uh, your colleagues to this community? So this is going to be full of assumptions. Uh, I think one thing is service design to a lot of people internally at Spotify is new. We both know, obviously, that service design itself is not new. Um, but the terminology, the methodologies, a lot of it is is new to folks. And so I think that's enticing to think there are things out there that methodologies out there of solving problems that I have that I don't know about. Like, I want to work with these people. I want to learn more about it. Um, I think one challenge that we're facing is that we are still like very early in that education phase of helping people understand how to best work with service design practitioners and what value service design practitioners can really add. And uh, I, I'm assuming that articles like the backstage, what, what, the backstage of service, yeah, what was the exact title? Do you recall? It was <laughs> backstage tickets to the world of service design. Exactly. Spotify. Yes. Uh, so I'm assuming the articles like that uh, help. Where do you see um, the, the need for most education? So if you... Maybe what are some of the biggest misconceptions or where do you see that there is opportunity for your colleagues to make better use of the service design capabilities? I'm trying to think of just one. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I think about a lot of the challenges that product designers face. Um, and one of them is a lot of product designers I know at some point in their career have been asked to design a deck for someone, whether it's a product manager or an engineer, whoever. Um, and some product designers love designing decks and there's nothing wrong with designing decks, but the, oftentimes it feels like a reduction of skill set of like, oh, I can only design decks. That's all I'm being sought out for as opposed to a uh, thought partnership. And for service design, I equate it to the request for like workshop facilitation or asking for a blueprint, for example. And so these are some of the challenges that we're facing today and that illustrate that kind of early stage education. Mm. Yeah, so a limited scope of uh, how service design can add value and where in the process it can add value. And I'm. it's not surprising that people first uh, tack on to the very tangible things like, I don't know, blueprints or workshops. And uh, it's hard to sort of see the added value, the strategic added value at the start of a project, defining a brief, stuff like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel fortunate that Spotify is full of people who are open to being told that, of saying like, oh, hey, you asked for a workshop for me to facilitate a workshop, but I actually question the need for this workshop. Can we talk about that? And they're like, oh yeah, let's talk about it. And so that like willingness to learn, I've I've definitely observed across the organization, which again, like is is very exciting because that means things can and will change. It just takes time. Yeah, I, uh, uh, hearing other stories from other in-house service design professionals, uh, uh, they would uh, love to trade places with you <laughs> hearing, this, <laughs> hearing this example. Um, um, so let, uh, let's just transition into a different topic. Uh, it's maybe a, a bit of, uh, I don't know, we're heading into all the uh, all different directions uh, today, but uh, that's okay. Uh, and it's mostly me to blame and my interest and curiosity. Um, you mentioned a career framework. So can you share a bit more about that? What's that? Uh, how did it come to be? Yeah, absolutely. So the career framework at Spotify for design was redesigned, relaunched, uh, almost a year ago now. I can't remember exactly when, and within the past 12 months. Um, and we went from something that was, uh, I'll say a bit minimal. Um, so not a, a ton of detail or specificity. Um, and we had identified some improvements there and uh, we shifted to this new one, which is very robust. Um, as I mentioned, we added the service design function on this career framework that didn't exist before. Um, and I think something that was really exciting that is working toward this vision of um, service design helping to uh, mature design in organizations, but also to communicate the value of service design is across all functions. We have 
a core set of competencies. And then for any function like product design or content design or service design, we have just like swap out two, right? So for example, vision and strategy, storytelling, human-centered approach, insights. These are things that all functions should have competency in. And then for service design specifically, we add in systemic design and information science, where for product design, we have more like prototyping and things of that nature. And so I think being able to communicate, we are all like thought leaders and and design partners with all of our cross-functional partners. And we have these like specialized skill sets within each of our functions. Hmm. Sounds really helpful and uh, valuable. When you say it is a robust framework, what makes it robust from your perspective? Yeah, I think being able to, so I gave, I don't know, five-ish examples of competencies. And though there are far more than five. <laughs> so that's what I mean by robust. And I think the um, risk of a very detailed uh, or robust, I might use those terms interchangeably, uh, career framework is that people might use it as a checklist. And so we've trained managers, people managers across the design organization to you know, guide and coach their uh, direct reports and, and in terms of not doing that, because it isn't a checklist. You don't need to be perfect across the board for all of the things in order to get promoted. Um, but, but yeah, I guess just having a very specific uh, framework. Uh, I can imagine that this also um helps people to see a path forward in their careers because especially in service design it's really hard to imagine you start out as a junior you started with as being a service design professional with less experience and then you uh, move on to becoming a service design professional with more experience but it's really hard to imagine okay so what's next what's what does progression look like except becoming a team lead like that's that almost yeah. looks like the only path forward yeah. does there, does your framework also include some things like that absolutely we distinguish between a people manager track um and an ic track we actually recently hired our first uh staff level uh service designer which is very exciting uh so that's um a very more senior than senior i would say um but i think it's also important to think about you you mentioned team lead and i i like to really distinguish between like a title and a role. And so um, you can be a team lead without necessarily being on the people manager track. Um, it's rare, transparently, but it's possible. And, and being able to be a very senior practitioner and leading a practice uh, is definitely possible and supported at Spotify for service design. And in that kind of role, you're uh, becoming more or less a principal kind of, that that's that's, the role I can imagine. Yeah, it's charting toward principle. Hmm. Hmm. That's right. How uh, how has this framework been received? It's been received very well from, I'll, I'll speak first from the design community and then the service design community. Um, so far, it's been received very well. Folks are very appreciative of the specificity so they know like what is actually expected of them in their roles and being very transparent of that has been very helpful. So people can actually assess their selves, uh, honestly. And, uh, from service designers in particular, um, I I've been told they haven't seen anything like it for service design in their careers. So that's really exciting that folks are feeling exactly as you had mentioned that like, here is a path. Like I, it's not just this uh, black box that I can try and break through. It's like, oh, it's actually very clearly laid out. What's what would be expected of me throughout the progression of this career? Hmm. Might be worth an article in the future <laughs> if you <laughs> if you decide to share anything more. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. So th this sounds like really helpful and valuable and interesting to to hear that you are developing this. One question that I had remaining about this is. Uh, what was the most challenging part coming up with this framework? The most challenging part was being distinct enough uh, across functions. So uh, I was a part of, I, I think there were five or six of us who developed this framework uh, last year. And we, I can't tell you how many hours we spent developing it. Um, and just the scrutiny of, 
okay, well, we're saying we expect this of a senior service designer, but how is that different from what we expect of a senior product designer and getting very specific across all of these many competencies? I think that was the most challenging part of just really dissecting what is the distinct value of anyone across any function in any role. Was in to which extent uh, I don't know if you have a design ops team or like was HR involved because this this doesn't sound yes. like a service design type of challenge per se. Yes, that's right. Um, we had HR involvement. We had the global head of design ops uh, involved. We had design directors across every business unit. Um, there was, yeah, we had a good mix of folks in the room who were putting this together. We also had um, our diversity and inclusion rep uh, who we were consulting with along the way to ensure that uh, none of it could be um, subjective in when going through and assessing someone against the framework. So it was it was a, a long journey to to get it there. But so if if that's such a long journey, which I can totally uh, imagine and applaud you for pulling pulling off. At the start, somebody uh, apparently agreed that this is worth the time and investment. Like, what was what was the reasons somebody signed off on you going on this journey and creating this framework? Yeah, that's that's actually a great question for our head of design ops because I believe this <laughs> this sign off happened before I, I joined the company. Um, so I joined the company knowing that this was something that they wanted to tackle and I, I joined the effort and uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So th that just shows how much effort there it takes. And especially if you're starting, I don't know if you're, you're probably not starting from scratch, but if you want to do it right and if you don't want to do it thoroughly and coming back sort of to the central theme of our conversation, like elevating design maturity, having a career framework in place sounds to me like definitely a prerequisite if you want to elevate design maturity within your org. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, something that I, I didn't mention also, which was key to this and key to elevating design maturity, whether it's through service design or, or not, is um, I know our global head of design ops uh, also worked very closely with other functions. So insights and engineering and product to work with them against their career frameworks as well so that they're all in dialogue with each other. It's not this silo of, okay, this is just designs thinking and what we're expecting. It's all in conversation together, which is really important. Mm. And you need a role like design ops to maintain this BD, BD champion for something like this. This doesn't happen like spontaneously. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, you need to get somebody from more people from the design ops community on the show. I've said that uh, a few times. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, ping Camden Moore. She's our, our global head of design ops and she's excellent. I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, surprisingly, we talked uh, quite a lot about the career framework, which is super interesting. Uh, but I want to switch back again to how uh, service design is organized and um, maybe about um, let's dive into the limitations uh, that you currently see of the current model. So service designers are embedded within product teams or tribes. Um, wh what's the limitation? <clears throat> I think right now the limitation is service design thinking is not always um, being leveraged in high level decision making um, of Right now, we are often leveraging it in, okay, we've decided this thing is important. Now we have service designers to think about this thing, but we don't, for the most part, we don't have a lot of service design thinking in the, hey, this is the thing that's important that X, Y, and Z teams should start thinking about. Um, and so, sorry to be so abstract about that, but I think like that's where I would love to get us to. And that's part of that is ensuring that service designers have that path in the that uh, that clear path through something like the career framework that we just spoke about so that they can elevate themselves as individuals to those positions but i think there's also a lot of opportunity to focus on folks who already hold those positions and ensuring that everyone is well equipped with this skill set or education not that everyone needs to be a service design practitioner or expert but to be well versed in it and to be thinking in those ways 
That's that's uh, again super interesting to hear your experience. And the great thing is that you have hands-on and practical experience, which you can, uh, uh, yeah, uh, reference. Now, one of the things that I'm also interested in is uh, what does this mean for hiring and staffing? Like, uh, if somebody is already part of a team and they have a roadmap for the next 12 months, I don't know how how far ahead these these teams plan. Um, I don't know how does how does that work with staffing, hiring? Yeah, right now, again, like the. I'll call it sharing of resources, very an inhuman way of saying it, to kind of collaborate across the organization um, is very organic. There's no, for service design, there's no like framework in place. There's no set um, rules or guidance of how to do it, which I think is right for us right now. Um, and so right now, the way we've been hiring is okay in this tribe. So if we're thinking about uh, the messaging organization, we have X, Y, or Z needs within messaging. I'll hire a service designer to help us think through that. Um, knowing that I'll be connect as that individual's line manager, I'll be connecting that individual across organizations to ensure that they have the right context and things of that nature. But even yesterday, there was a, a request for service design help in a different part of the organization who presumably doesn't have service design support. And they're reaching out in the organization and say, is anyone interested in this kind of work? Uh, like, how can we start to, like, we have serv clear service design needs and how can we address those? So super organic today. Um, and in the future, I imagine that'll change. Oh, one other question related to this is, if you look back at your eight, last 18 months there, what would you describe as the maybe the biggest progression that has been made from your perspective? Again, we have to put an asterisk next to everything you say. Probably like this is this is your opinion and this is your experience. <laughs> so, uh, what do, what do you feel has been the biggest progression in the last months? I think the biggest progression is people are asking for service design. That's huge. I, I almost can't believe that it's happening as much as it is, honestly. And I think like uh, as cheesy as it sounds, the whole like making service design famous has paid off. People might not know exactly what they need from us, but they know to ask us. And that's a, an amazing first step because that immediately brings visibility to service design practitioners across the company to things that they might not have had visibility to previously. So what's the, and this is like the million dollar question, like what made service design famous? Did you have a number one hit? Like what was, <laughs> was there a star project? Did the CEO pitch you somewhere? Like what, what created the demand that now people are knocking on your door instead of you having to sort of go around and trying to sell what you do? Yeah, it's a few things. I think honestly, getting service design called out in the career framework was huge. Like for the design community that all immediately all however many 300 plus designers were like, oh, service design is a recognized thing here. And so that that was huge, calling that out explicitly because everyone kind of knew we had a bunch of product designers or people who were titled as product designers who did service designy stuff. Um, but calling it out explicitly was was maybe uh, step one. I think again that that presentation I mentioned at our um, our annual design all hands uh, was also huge. It broke service design down very simply for um, for anyone, however much uh, exposure they've had to it in the past, uh, and and identified where we're having impact across the organization utilizing the, these methodologies and thinking. Um, and then uh, another part of it is also just schmoozing. So uh, <laughs> at at work events, um, talking up the work of service designers and doing so cross-functionally specifically. So connecting with the VP of engineering and saying, hey, did you know Rebecca created this systems architecture map that like engineering managers are saying are better than the ones that they can make? And they're identifying all these opportunities that we need to be investing in. Like that piques interest immediately. And those conversations, when they happen casually and naturally, can be really impactful. 
I love that. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you need a role of somebody you know, smoothing. <laughs> How did you put it? <laughs> yeah. Smoothing service design. Uh, but yeah, totally. If you if that happens often enough, and if you just keep drop name dropping service design and the impact and the outcomes and the how it's been received uh and and sharing the results um yeah you're almost like a pr manager or something something like that i know and I, it does sound sleazy of like making it famous but i think that i think acknowledging that you can make it famous without fully educating someone first was really important because that unblocked a lot of progress where it's like make it famous people are now asking you about it then you can step into now this phase that we're in now, which is focusing on that education piece, both within our community of how can we educate each other about different like share methodologies and tool sets, um, but also our cross-functional partners. Yeah. So yeah, again, a big uh, uh, compliment here that you use, you marketed and positioned service design in a way that it becomes attractive for people to to get them curious to learn more. And I think that's the best position you can be in uh, because if there's a demand, it's much easier to educate people rather than having to shove it down their throat. And now there is demand, people are sort of curious, tell me more about it. It's um, So yeah, doing good marketing, doing good positioning, uh, maybe... <laughs> Maybe maybe hire somebody from the marketing team to help you out with that <laughs> stuff because it, it it works right if you if you yeah. do it right it works yeah um, so what's the next thing on uh, your wish list uh, what's the what's the next step in design maturity yeah I think I'm and I'm not gonna call it a wish list because we're just doing it uh, I think like bucket list let's call this, it the bucket list <laughs> yes bucket list I love it I love it love the reframing um yeah I think we're doubling down on this education piece uh again both within our service design community to ensure that we are knowledge sharing both around how we approach problems so as I mentioned methodologies tools sets, kits, whatever. Uh, and also just giving visibility of the type of work happening and doing critique with each other and really helping build each other, uh, each other's skill set. And then also cross-functionally, right? So how can we now educate uh, our cross-functional partners on the value that we bring who haven't worked with us directly yet and what types of things to pull us into and what to ask us for. Um, instead of saying like, hey, can you facilitate this workshop? Say, hey, I have an idea for a workshop. Will you work with me to see if that's the right thing we need to do? Like simple reframings uh, will, be, will be big for us. I think something you and I touched on maybe earlier in this chat too is uh, engaging in more of a dialogue with the broader external to Spotify service design community that's um, something that the team is really excited about. I think we are hungry to learn and we're hungry to share our successes and failures as well um, in service of, of others' growth. Um, and so I think that's our immediate focus for now. And um, I'll be thinking a lot this year about that staffing and resourcing question that we talked about and how we're organized and uh, how and, and when it might make sense to evolve our current structure. Mm. Mm. Sounds exciting. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you couldn't you couldn't hope or expect that there would be such a demand for service design right now. If you uh, think back, I don't know, two years ago. If we fast forward to the next eighteen months or two years, and you sort of uh, your wildest dreams, what is the thing <laughs> you can't imagine happening right now, which might happen eventually in two years? Does, does does my question make sense? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> okay. no, it's a wonderful question. Um, and two things come immediately to mind. One of them is the highest order leadership, like not understanding why someone in service design or design is not involved in certain decision making if it's not happening. I mean, while the streams, it's happening and there's no issue, obviously. Um, but I think that that buy-in and acknowledgement of if it's not happening, why the hell not? Uh, and I think another another piece to that is who you know we talk we talked again about the cliche at the beginning of this around design having a seat at the table, but what if like anyone who's at the table has design thinking like is is like activating their service design thinking chops while they're sitting at the table what whatever their function or title is I think that would be kind of a dream for me. That basically means uh, giving 
everybody across the entire organization a certain level of design vocabulary that they know yeah. how to speak the language of design without being having to become a, a trained design practitioner. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and I think that's a very, very good idea. I'm really curious uh, <laughs> where you'll be in two years and how far. Me I, too. <laughs> I, I'm expecting that now that you've stated this publicly, that you'll probably be even further than you sort of hope for. It usually goes uh, with that. Uh, like that. That was the whole reason I came on the show. Just keeping myself accountable. That's good. <laughs> just uh, kidding. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> Joking. Yeah, no, who, who knows? Uh, so um, what I was curious is uh, you, you already have tons of experience. Uh, if you would meet uh, um, your your past self or your future self, your past self make, makes more sense and you go back five years in time and you could give yourself one piece of advice, which piece of advice would you give yourself? I think the piece of advice I would give myself is however insurmountable a challenge may seem, baby steps can make a lot of impact. Um, and so just start doing little things and you'll be surprised by what can happen from it. Mm, is, that, is that like eating uh, the elephant with one spoon at a time <laughs> sort of <laughs> sort of thing? I think that's the I same, think so. right? Maybe. <laughs> I think, I think it's something. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> or am I completely butchering the saying? I don't know. I'll Google it later. No, no. <laughs> I, I'm the worst person with these uh, metaphors. I always botch them. But yeah, I think like not waiting for something to be perfect or for you to have this perfect, grandiose plan. Just like have a vision, take a step see what happens you might fall on your face and that's fine but it was such a small step couldn't have been that big of a fall mm -hmm. cool so if we try to summarize the last 45 minutes 50 minutes um what would your summary be from our chat the summary would be uh that to elevate uh design maturity and product organizations i think it would be very impactful to use service design thinking uh in doing that and not necessarily elevating service design individuals to these uh positions of power which would be great but it doesn't have to just be that but elevating the craft through people whatever function they have thank you and uh, i sort of feel that we touched upon many things uh and uh maybe i'll need to re-listen to the entire uh to the entire conversation myself to sort of see and knit everything together and i think that's the interesting part this isn't a one uh a silver bullet solution. There are just many moving pieces that okay. all need to, it's a big puzzle and uh, you need to work on multiple areas at the time. So yeah, I think with many things of service that service designers deal with, it's, it's messy. It is. It's super messy. And, and, and so was this conversation. No, <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And I appreciate you coming on and uh, sort of continuing your, uh, um, ethos of sharing publicly, just like you did with the articles. I hope you'll continue doing that and keeping, uh, keep sharing that, like you said, your successes, but maybe also your failures in the future uh, and sharing that with a broader community. We need this, we need examples uh, like you. So uh, once again, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is fun. Isn't it awesome that we got a brief look at how service design works at Spotify? I'm really curious to learn what your biggest takeaway is from this conversation. Make sure to leave a short comment down below. I've been sharing conversations with industry experts like Neve every two weeks on this channel for over six years now, and I don't plan to stop anytime soon. So if you don't want to miss any of the new conversations, make sure you subscribe. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I want to thank you for spending a part of your day with me. It's an absolute honor and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.